I mean, what he said about Kim Jong Un, you know, what he said about him saying about Biden, and that, those are the issues that highlighted the visit. Oh, that would be, well, let's go over that quote for a second. The president pointed out, first he did it on Twitter, and then right. said it to a microphone, right. that Kim Jong Un, and it really reports to me a few days described Joe Biden as a low, low IQ, IQ individual. And on that, I agree with him. Disaster. You don't usually say those things about a political right. former vice president when you're overseas. Yeah. But Mr. Trump breaks all the rules. Yeah, he does that. And it dovetails into this other uh, sort of bizarre issue where you had a White House directive to cover up obscure a warship that had former Senator John McCain died recently and became an adversary mm -hmm. somehow of uh, President Trump. Again, this sort of breaking the norms of criticizing and, and, and going after an American war hero, a former senator. Technically, you know that that ship was named for the, the late the senator grandpa. and his father and his grandfather, right. who were right. all naval right. officers. Right. Name was exactly. it but, but either way, but the president later did not apologize and say it was a bad idea. He said, I had nothing to do with it. I wouldn't have ordered that. But whoever thought of that idea to cover McCain's name while I visit the base in Japan, he meant well. He was well-intentioned. So it, it didn't bother Donald Trump as an idea. It, it is really, it is, uh, it, it, it is a scandal. It's a bigger scandal than we, uh, our reaction suggests. I mean, you're talking about a U.S. ship in foreign waters, you know, I mean, it's right there. You want to cover the name of the ship, you know, I mean, that's, that's the flag that it's flying. This ship has been involved, you know, in sailors, they made, you know, uh, take out the, the, the people that are wearing. But you said but, McCain on their ass. But Trump said when it comes to McCain, I'm not yes. a fan. He's not a fan. I mean, that, okay, but, uh, but the, 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 the incident itself is really scandalous. It is. We have just about one minute here, and I just wanted to go over very quickly. There was an announcement from the White House that uh, the U.S. Uh, would be uh, uh, imposing tariffs on Mexico uh, as a penalty for allowing these large groups of immigrants coming to, through Mexico to the U.S. border. From right. Central, Central America, America from Central America. America. It was a Thursday night surprise. Let's punish Mexico with a 5% tariff on everything made in Mexico. And so really, again, we just have one minute. I want to quickly to you guys. When we look at China trade policy, we have tariffs. We have Mexico tariffs. It seems to be the one cudgel that the, the administration is willing to wield. Um, is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? 30 seconds. It's a bad idea because it hurts American consumers, it hurts American farmers, uh, it hurts uh, people who are uh, trading with Mexico. And there's a new deal between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. A new trade deal that Congress supposedly will take up soon and that the, the, the legislatures in Mexico are considering. And then now President Trump wants to punish Mexico. It's disruptive. Two things to say. The president has described himself as a tariffs man. He doesn't apologize. Right and he describes himself as a disruptor. And that's what we see every week right here in the studio. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, that is what we have for this week. Thanks so much to Daniel the senior Washington correspondent for I-24 News, and Saeed Arakat, Washington Bureau Chief at al Quds Daily Newspaper. This program is produced by Patrice Martin. Our engineer is Justin Thwaites. And I'm Michael Williams. Thanks for listening.
importance of promoting international religious freedom as a key aspect of America's foreign policy. This law also created the position of IRS ambassador at large to lead the U.S. government's efforts, as well as an IRS office. The office monitors religious persecution and discrimination worldwide, recommends and implements policies in respective regions or countries, and develops programs to promote religious freedom. The Office of International Religious Freedom also publishes an annual report which describes the status of religious freedom in every country. It covers government policies violating religious beliefs and practices of groups, religious denominations and individuals, and U.S. policies to promote religious freedom around the world. The office also identifies countries of particular concern. These are nations guilty of particularly severe violations of religious freedom. On this edition of the program, we'll talk with Sam Brownback, who was appointed as Ambassador-at-Large for International Religious Freedom in February 2018, about the state of religious freedom, or lack thereof, around the world. Sam Brownback has a long and distinguished career in public service. Most recently, he was Governor of the State of Kansas from 2011 to 2018. Previously, he served for 15 years as a U.S. Senator. While a member of the Senate, he worked actively on the issue of religious freedom in multiple countries and was a key sponsor of the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. Ambassador Brownback, welcome to the program. Thank you. Pleasure to join you. Well, thanks for hosting us right here at the State Department. Let's talk about the primary mission of the International Religious Freedom Office. Well, the primary focus of it is to bring religious freedom to everybody, everywhere, all the time. Well, we don't think of faith or people with lack of faith. We just say this is a fundamental right. We believe it's a God-given right that no government has the right to interfere with, that government should protect this right uh, and not interfere with it. And that's the primary focus. The office was created roughly 20 years ago by Congress. I'm the fifth ambassador to serve in it, but this administration, this is a key topic, so it's gotten elevated a lot more, and we also think that if we can get this one right, you're going to have less terrorism, more economic growth, and your other basic human rights will flourish as well. This is really a foundation on a key thing for countries to get right. And how does your background, very extensive background, you were a senator, a member of Congress, a governor, how does it prepare you for this work? Uh, almost perfectly, honestly. Uh, I was one of the original sponsors of the first bill. When I first went into the Senate, I started doing religious freedom advocacy work for individuals. I had a staff member of the entire thing was in the Senate, but that was their job, was to advocate for people that were persecuted around the world. And you found yourself dealing with just the worst situations, but that if you could give a person a name instead of a number in some foreign jail that's languishing, usually they were a religious minority, you can often keep them alive, you could sometimes get them free, and sometimes they would be out and immigrate to Europe or the United States. I run into some of them now as religious freedom advocates, or people that I helped get out of jail in other countries, but they, you know, they have such a heart for it because it happened to them, and they know others that it's happening to, and they feel it's wrong, and they, they ought to help them out. Can you give us some examples of these people? Well, there's a, a gentleman here, I don't want to put his name out on this, but he was in jail in China, is out now, and is one of the lead religious freedom advocates here in Washington on what's taking place in China today. He experienced it himself personally. He has a passion for it, and he's now out trying to help other people have the same experience that he did of being sent to jail, left in jail, forgotten until somebody advocates for him. He wants people not to go to jail in the first place just for exercising their religious freedom. I do want to get to China later in the program because of the discrimination against Christians and also Muslims. But first let's talk about the fact that religious freedom is really a bedrock value here in the United States. It's part of our First Amendment. It's very critical to our society and our government. We have separation of church and state, so to speak. How do you convey this value to other countries who perhaps don't share that same value and that same sense of separation between 
church and state or mosque and state, as it may be. How is that received by other countries for which this is maybe not a commonly shared value? You know, most nations guarantee religious freedom. In their constitution, most nations have signed on to the UN Charter of Human Rights that guaranteed religious freedom, the freedom to pick a religion, not to have a religion to convert, to practice the faith peacefully any way that you choose. So that part's really not that hard to sell. Most people, yeah, I agree, 